Well, hello and welcome to another thrilling edition of the Andrew Eborn Show, where I am delighted to be joined celebrating a new year by a stellar royalty. It is, in fact, Spears. How are you, Spears? Hello, how are you? Hey, not too bad. I can't see you. Well, I'm here. You are? Is it? Is it just a, a little audio thing? Have you got your video as well? Uh, well, it didn't tell me to switch on the camera because I thought that was automatic. Hang on, hang on, start video. <laughs> there we go. Yay, there you go. Look at you with your finery. That's, uh, that's got to be good. Ah, uh, that's what you want, the shining light. It wouldn't be the same without those little lights. And I'll tell you what, Christmas must have been hell for you, wasn't it? Did you manage to stand out at Christmas? Well, you're quite right there. Christmas is uh, not a very good time for the Spiz uh, image because uh, basically I disappear into the lights. <laughs> Where, so I'm quite glad when all the Christmas decorations come down because I'm able to uh, shine again. Oh, well, January's what? your month, isn't it? I think this is what happens. People say, let's get Christmas out of the way. We want to see Spiz. That's what it's going to be about. That's right. And um, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, the summer months aren't too good either because there's too light at eight o'clock, nine o'clock. I have to wait till night. But of course, we can't go out anywhere at the moment. But in the olden days, we used in to go out. In the olden days, we could do all of it. So did you spend Christmas with Judy? Yes, we stayed at home and, uh, yeah, we did, yeah. <laughs> and who, who, cooked, who cooked the Christmas lunch? Uh, I do. I cook, I cook 90% of the meals here. No. It's the only way to survive. <laughs> so what would be a traditional Christmas lunch in your household then? Well, because uh, my daughter couldn't join us, so she, uh, so we had, a, we, we had no point getting a big turkey. So we got a, a, one of them crowns, they call it, isn't it? It's just a breast piece. Oh, the turkey crown, they're really good, those. Yeah, they are, because they fit in. I don't have to spend 10 hours in the kitchen like I did last year. I said, no, that's the last year I'd say that I'm not doing another Christmas turkey because it just takes too long. No, and I'll tell you what, the only, thing, the only problem with the crown, though, is if you don't get the dark meat, do you? I do. I'm, I'm, you know, everybody in the family likes the breast meat. I'm the only one who sort of likes the dark meat, and oh, I do. You're always the dark side, Spears. I know this is this is what happens. You're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna miss it. I tell you what, we were so delighted to have you on Stella TV last year because not only do you bring you, but you bring your zillions of followers, and you were by far, by far the social media king. You went out there, and all your fans followed and tuned in. It was brilliant. I, I, I do consider myself quite adept at uh, social media marketing, yes, and guerrilla marketing and any other marketing you can think of. So gorilla... but I, didn't go to, I didn't go to college to train to do it. It's just a natural uh, instinct that I grew up uh, from uh, the punk ethos of uh, DIY and, uh, and branding yourself. Once I saw Lou Reed wearing his own T-shirt, I thought, well, why am I wearing anyone else's T-shirt? No, and, and, and your branding is always brilliant. So last time with a brilliant, brilliant song about the Christmas market, Christmas in Denmark Street. I absolutely loved it. I love the video as well for that. Uh, and last time we saw you were branded everywhere, the Christmas uh, in Denmark Street. And just around the corner, I'm just at Regent's Park, so along from Euston. And I saw yeah. all the big placards everywhere uh, with, with Christmas in Denmark Street there as well. Yeah, well, uh, that's on my route to Camden, see, from London Bridge on my bicycle ride. And there's a, there was railings there, I thought railings. And there was a demo going on about H HS2, the uh, cross, uh, cross Nation Railway, which we don't need, actually, on my green, on my green soapbox. It's, uh, uh, now we realise we can't all get crowd into trains and, um, you know, let's, 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 let's democratise the country and move industries out, including people. Let's move people around the country and not make everything London-centric. So I've got more room. But that's no good to me, because I need people to see my banners. On the... I don't know, I'm shooting myself in the foot. <laughs> and that's the other thing that's been really frustrating, because it was two years virtually to the day when you were last in Europe, in Essen, weren't you? That's right, 19th of Jan, we did a special birthday party for Essen. We seventh played there birthday the party, the seventh birthday party, wasn't it? Yeah, we, well, we played there the year before and uh, we were, you know, we, we actually ran out of songs because the audience <laughs> made us play everything we knew. So yeah. we thought, right, when we got this birthday party invitation, because we're fun, we're a fun show. We're not a growly, growly, shouty, spitty punk band. We're entertainment, glam punk, if you like. And uh, so, um, uh, yeah, we... Um, we, we uh, what did we do? Where, where was I? I lost my thread there for a minute. Oh, you, you, you were in that? Essen. You were in Essen two years and oh, a, yeah. a day ago. That's where you were. <laughs> Seventh birthday yeah, so party. We, 
we played, we played out, we rehearsed extra songs. We rehearsed even more songs. And yes, they still wouldn't let us off the stage. So we said, right, we got this. So we played the, the next three, four songs yeah. and they still wouldn't let us play, get off the stage because they have to walk through the state audience to get off because right. it's a, a low stage and there's no, the dressing room's not, you know, not next to the stage. So we, uh, they, we, they wouldn't let us off, which we loved, of course. But oh, then, you love it. So, so how many times did you have to play Captain Kirk? Well, no, we did Soldier Soldier again. Oh, but brilliant. We did, we did it with improvised introductions, improvised extra solos. And we extended it from uh, to about seven or eight minutes. And then, well, if that's not enough to make you want to let us off. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I like, like, let me take you back then to your early childhood where you're growing up in, in Knoll at uh, Arden School. What do you remember about those days? Well, I went to uh, Arden School uh, following my brother, my eldest brother went there. My middle brother went to Harold Malley in Surrey Hall, which he wasn't very happy about because he had to get up an hour earlier. But could he pronounce his H's? That's the problem. It's rather like hurricanes never happen in Hertfordshire, isn't it? Like uh... Harold Malley, yeah. So we went to, uh, I went to the school there. So my brother had done all the groundwork as being a big, big character. So I, I just followed in his footsteps a bit. And then while I was there, you know, uh, the glam rock thing happened. So I was the first kid who just thought he could copy David Bowie's hairstyle. Uh, the only one with red hair in the school and using my mum's hair lacquer because there was no hair gel back then. And then uh, you know, the whole, uh, all, as you walked into assembly in the morning, everyone just turns around and looks at you. And I thought, I kind of like that feeling. And then uh, <laughs> uh, I, I also was the first uh, only male uh, school to dye his, uh, a school pupil to dye his hair blonde, bleach it blonde. And in oh, those days, you didn't have the off-the-shelf uh, bleaches you have nowadays. You, know, you had to go to a lady's hairdresser's when I was like, uh, I was about 14, 15, and then all these uh, pensioners were getting their hair done, and they thought, oh, it's a lovely little boy, isn't he? And so, uh, yeah, so I enjoyed school because it was a captive audience. Uh, people couldn't leave the classroom when I, when I was mucking about. So and, and I, it's I like a great way of sort of standing out, as you say, that, that influence with, uh, with, with Bowie, which we've come on to for your, for your latest single as well. It's fantastic. But also trying to be different in those sort of days was really, really interesting. It's like Adam and the Ants. I remember when they sort of first appeared around the same sort of time. Um, I, the, the, he used to have that white stripe, you remember. Uh, and I remember yeah. getting this boot polish, <laughs> which you could do. And just doing it with that, you just improvised, didn't you? Well, yeah, well, the first concert I ever did was with uh, some lads from school. We got together and rehearsed at lunchtimes and we did the end of term school disco yeah. with, uh, and the band was called Blast, because that's the northern way of saying it. But um, uh, I, that's what I wanted to call it. Very uh, sort of uh, active art name, uh, pre-punk this is. And, uh, but they wanted to call it Black Sword because they were all into Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and our initials were S. W O R D. So that's where we called ourselves Black Sword. So I wasn't very happy about that, but uh, that was okay. Uh, I, I got to name all of my bands much later on. <laughs> Oh, and, and talk, and we come on to talk about naming bands, and, and I'm so disappointed, so disappointed that Guinness World Records did not recognise your fantastic, because you changed your name every year, didn't you? Yeah, we did it for 12 years on the, on the bands, and uh, uh, that's when someone suggested it, I should write to the Guinness Book of Records, because it seemed like a record, you know, no one else had done this. And I wrote in and I got a letter back from Sheila Thomas and she said that uh, uh, it was too specialised and there's people who've eaten motorbikes. What do you mean? They're specialised. There's a guy who um, the most apples chopped in half with a chainsaw in a minute. You've got a parrot that opens up beer cans in, in, a, in one minute. You've got the stretchiest skin. You've got to have it, haven't you? But then the killer was in the bottom of the letter that Sheila Thomas wrote, deputy editor, she wrote, right. Oh, where's Captain Kirk? Well, I thought that was just an easy way in. Unbelievable. It was unbelievable, but she actually had, she confessed, because I, I read the article, she confessed that she actually had a copy of your record yeah. about where's Captain Kirk. And she was a fan. I that actually, Guinness World Records are just up the street, because I used to do lots of work with them as well. We used to distribute um, uh, digitally all the video, all the different records. And I reckon you're still in with a chance there. But maybe well, maybe they were, the they were afraid that they would have to update it every year. <sighs> Because there was more names to come. <laughs> but that's okay. They, they like it. it's an annual thing. This is the great thing about it, which is why what I admired about your, not only your social media, but your marketing. If you change your name every year and you change your image, it's rather like a football club, isn't it? So you change your kit because you're selling yep. it. Well, uh, yeah, but back in uh, when I, we start, started changing the name, of course, there was no internet then. It was all uh, posters were out of date. We would turn up 
in a different town and they had last year's name still on the poster because they hadn't quite caught up, which was fair enough. You know, they weren't to know, uh, <laughs> but they should have done, but they didn't. So, uh, but now the internet's caught up with me and I, I'm able to brand the show on a name. So I've got uh, my Italian band where I call it Spiz Italia and I've got my acoustic outfit, which is me and Luca usually, but sometimes other band members join me and that's Spizology. So I don't want people to think they're going to see Spiz Energy when we're not going to be Spiz Energy. There's going to be something different and that's what I do. And it's great because you do adapt to the, to the environment. I mean, you do a lot of stuff on social media. You can do a version of Spiz to suit any audience, which is fantastic. What have you been doing in lockdown? We'll come on to the writing in a bit, but have you been doing any live gigs? On Are you a Zoom performer? Are we all Zoomed? I did a couple of DJ spit spots. Uh, and it Spiz just FM, did, it, yeah. I, I like Spiz FM. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but I've got my radio show and... Uh, today as it goes uh but the the, the thing about it that it facebook mutes uh copyrighted material so you're basically just nodding along to silence and then you talk between the records and then you're nodding on, along to silence it's rubbish but with your own with you doing your own song but the, the sound quality you can, you're not getting you're not guaranteeing the sound quality at the other end of the phone or if they're doing it on a laptop or whether they're doing it through the hi-fi or big tilly so it, uh, I, it's, not, it's not the right experience. Also, sound is physical. When you're live at the 100 Club and that bass and drums are smashing right. and you get, you get, you feel it in your chest and, and you can see the singer sweating on you. Well, not, not me, of course. Uh, but then, yeah, that's it. You, you, you lose that on a, on a not, not like this, it's an interview, it's just chat, yeah. this is easy. Oh, no, but, but, but that's the other interesting thing is that people have adapted to this media and we've had all sorts of wonderful people on from Charles Spencer came on the Andrew Vaughan show, talked about his wonderful book, we had a great time with him. Toya's a regular, she's, she's a mate and you, I know you've, you've worked with her with a lot of things and lots of fantastic musicians, PJ Proby and so on and so forth have been on the show. What I love about it is people have adapted and they get to peek beneath you, if you like, the public persona and get to feel really, really connected. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But talk about what I want to do, because your history going back with everybody from, from Bowie when you were dyeing your hair, with Susie and the Banshees, because that was one of the first times, that, um, was it uh, Barbarella, wasn't it, uh, all the way back then, when you leapt up on stage. Tell That's me about I, yeah. that night. My first performance was me after seeing the clash at barbarella's uh july 27 1977 i thought i could do this i want to do this and there was a punk festival organized because now the uh nightclubs were get cottoning on that they could fill the room with the uh, with people they put this punk rock stuff on and so i i, I knew that one of the bands playing i blagged the spot on there and then after that I, I went to london uh with the same band and and did the same sort of thing and i got uh bernie rose was the promoter and uh dave woods was an agent there and he saw me he thought i was funny and then i got booked for the vortex where i then got hooked up, got got you know made more waves and progress and then with the susie gigs started doing susie gigs and uh it was the it just led on from there then i got uh a, a, a good notices for uh spears oil supporting susie on the 23rd of uh, July 1978 at the Roundhouse, and we got on. Uh, we got on uh, an offer to do the John Peel session, and off, off the back of the John Peel session, we got the Rough Trade deal to release the songs that we did on the Run John Peel session. And then the Susie had their first tour, and so we were natural, uh, sort of easy to get on and booked booked us for the whole tour for the Scream tour 1978. And that's how. And that, so I went from playing in a pub, standing on a, a couple of beer crates to Amsmith Odeon in 10 months. Oh, and that just, brilliant, isn't it? That can't happen today. No, well, no, but what I love about it, what I love about it is you are always going out, because by, by, by going out and performing, people get to see you and they book you for the next gig, don't they? That's it, well, well people were out and about. That's, 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 what, that's another thing we've lost right now, you know, that physicality of, of ch ch chatting to the agent or manager at the bar and getting the next gig. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. But talk to me then, I mean, because you've had some phenomenal success in, in, in your time and you, some people get bored, if you like, of having to play their fantastic, well-known hit. I mean, how do you feel about Where's Captain Kirk? Well, um, uh, I don't know, let's ask him. Hey, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what it is, uh, I actually fell out of love with the song. Um, I... I uh, I thought I just had enough of, of doing it. And uh, in, that was in 1983, 84. And so uh, I noticed the audiences started to dwindle. 
so it came back in. But I was still doing Soldier Soldier, and uh, I thought that would count. But uh, no, they. But I, I, I would sing it over and over again for anyone who I, I've even I sing it down the phone to people. You know. Uh, go on then. Go on. I, I can't leave you without. Go on. Give us a bit of Captain Kirk. Well, well, no, no, no. You got. You got. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's true. You see, I, 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 could, I'm not, I'm not. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll, I'll persuade you at the very end. We're going to finish with a live version. This will keep it right to the end. Your social media trick, like right to the end. We're going to have a live version of, of Captain Kirk from Spitz. It's going to be good. Right at the end. We're up the garage. This is good. Um, but Captain Kirk itself, it won all sorts of accolades. I know you might get bored with it, but NME. We had the Mobo Awards and things. How did that make you feel? Well, it's always nice to get. Uh, well, I knew anyway that it was uh, popular because it stayed at the independent record labels chart when it was formed on the January the 19th, 1980 for eight weeks. And then the whole year it stayed in that chart for that year. So I knew it was liked. Uh, but yes, it's always great to get uh, uh, in, in print that uh, it's, 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 it's justified that it's, it's a such song of uh, endurance. Yes. God, Good. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, I, I, you know, it's just, just it's just a pat on the back, uh, but you have to move on. Like, luckily, I've, I've managed to make a couple of highlights since, since Captain Kirk. Oh, no, I loads of highlights, but two, two extra ones which I particularly liked is that uh, uh, John Peel said it was like the best spin-off, if you like, from uh, from, from, from Star Trek. And that there yeah, there, of there's lots of other Star Trek songs out there by other artists, including <laughs> cast members. <laughs> and uh, yes, it was the best song that it would it would be on the jukebox of the uh, Starship Enterprise. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So that's that's a good accolade. And the other one which I like is REM and the Connection because they did a cover version of it, didn't they? Yeah, they had this thing where they gave away because they were that uh, uh, better off than most artists, being mega mega band, mega stadium rock band, and yeah. they gave away to their fan club members a disc every Christmas. Yeah. And on 1992, they'd recorded. Uh, a version of Where's Captain Kirk? And I'm guessing they took the uh, arrangement from the Erg Music War, which would have been shown a lot in America uh, on cable and stuff. And I would know that the bass player from REM worked in a record shop in Athens, Georgia, and he was a big Anglophile. So he would get the enemy posted over there and he would also have all the rough trade records in the shop. And I think he was the one who probably drove the uh, the idea of doing Where's Captain Kirk? So there you go, they say. That's my I'm little brilliant. bit of background and I knowledge. Really Hope. I'm Spears. You started your life, as you know, under the name of Kenneth Spears. Um, I, 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 well, I, do, I, imagine. I sincerely hope that REM, when they phoned up to ask permission, said, What's the frequency, Kenneth? No, they didn't. And they didn't phone me up at all either. And I also wrote to them uh, via the uh, fan club because they sent me one. They sent me The fan club sent me one because I got in touch with the fan club. They sent me a copy of the record. And then I, I said, uh, I found out their uh, London agent. And when they were going to do the Milton Keynes Bowl, I suggested, I suggested that it would be a good idea for them to have me guesting on at the Encore to do Where's Captain Kirk? And I didn't get an answer, frankly. Oh, really? Oh, well, that's I, something I else we're going to have to so I got a better chance. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, the other thing we should rectify as well is that this Guinness World Record thing, because I think there's a couple of that angles we can do here as well. The Marquee Club, for example, you were the only band, the only band to pay five consecutive nights. And That's right. you did a bonus matinee, which was dry, wasn't it? Yeah, we did it under 18s, uh, alcohol free on the Saturday, but we had to do it in the morning. We, well, we had to do it at 12 o'clock, the doors open, because uh, we had to be out at two. For the, uh, the the next band on the Saturday night, so yeah, we did, and yeah, I've been speaking to Nigel, the uh, guy who booked us for that, uh, who was a marquee booker. Uh, I think he's in your Facebook friends. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, so he's doing a book on uh, the marquee, long overdue. I think. I think I, I thought you'd have done this ages ago, but with the lockdown, yeah. now he's got time. It, well, he should have done. Well, I, many years ago, I organised. Um, I was good chums with Harold Pembleton. Um, who set up the Marquee Club and uh, Harold oh. uh, and we were going to have a, a, the 50th anniversary on Wardour Street, 100 Wardour Street. Uh, we, we did a big party uh, for him and we got all the great and the good. Uh, I think you didn't answer your phone or something. You're far too busy. But we got a lot of people came down. We had a big celebration uh, for Harold down there. But you're right. A we have phones then. Club. What's that? Sorry? We have phones then. Oh, no, I don't think. I think I, I sent the carrier pigeon, but I think you ate it. Uh, but you only had the crown, if I remember rightly. Yes, that's right. <laughs> it was all good stuff. But the Marquee Club was a fantastic venue, wasn't it? What, what are your memories of the Marquee Club? Well, I, I was, I was telling, speaking to Nigel about his book, and uh, it, it, for me, it was, as punk happened, obviously, it was a lot of confusion over who was a punk band and who wasn't. 
So as far as we're concerned, but in Birmingham, when uh, Eddie and Hot Rod's uh, live EP at the Marquee came out, you know, for me, they were a punk band. I didn't know the difference. No one knew that back then, the, the, the sub-genre. And uh, yeah, so like, to see the cover on, with the photo of the band in front of the Marquee awning. So when I got to play there myself, I got to play there with the Human League in March uh, 1979 or April, maybe, because uh, they just had a, a big uh, boost from David Bowie uh, going to their gig at the Nashville rooms and because he said yeah the human league they're the future he didn't say it like Joe Strummer he said it like David Bowie and he said yeah they're, they're the future and uh, <laughs> uh, so they, they did their gig that's what my first gig at the uh, the marquee was uh, supporting the human league and it was great I loved it it's a great shape and when I moved to London I was in there uh, pretty much two or three nights a week you'd find me uh, in the bar uh, with either oh, fantastic and it's now been converted into uh, another one of these restaurants we've been trying to bring back live music and things like that but a lot of these clubs in london have now disappeared haven't they i mean you were mourning the loss we talked about denmark street you're mourning the loss about uh, the club there as well because you used to spend all your time there. that was your youth club effectively wasn't it yeah yeah we, we bands would uh, drop in after they'd finished playing somewhere else like uh, like the hundred club where they kicked you out at 11 and uh the, 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 it would be open till one o'clock or a little longer and then I'd wobble home on my bicycle and that's when I wrote Christmas in Denmark Street after the after that uh, the last week of the 12 bar club it was a terrible loss to the music scene as well as the, the it was it, people that made it it was the atmosphere that it, it wasn't the building itself no, it certainly wasn't the building itself. I mean, it's a pretty, like a lot of those sort of venues. It's one like the the the, uh, the eye to eye club and things like that. And I, I think those the two eyes are there, and they always those sort of places. It's all about the atmosphere. It's all about the people who created, isn't it? And tell me, because yeah. you were terribly creative, not just in terms of uh, designing the covers, but also in in what you were wearing and things like that. What did you wear in those days? Well, I I was actually. Uh, sorry, uh, always wanting to flip everything i um when 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 uh, the music papers started to uh, have uh, adverts for clash zip zip gear and all the kids were starting to switch to uh, wearing punk zip i thought that was too much of a uniform so i sort of went like the elvis costello way and went the opposite and wear wore hush puppies and 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 uh, uh, went to the charity shops and got with them uh, some grandfather uh, tweed jacket so i looked for the all sense of purpose the opposite of punk for a while and then of course uh, you get into the rock and roll lifestyle a bit and you get the tight jeans and then you get the leather jacket and then you start you, yeah but uh, i was uh, always interested in transforming all my clothes so it said spiz on it really yeah well, well that, but that was it that was as I say the whole punk ethos it was all about being homemade and the rip things were all about that sort of stuff to, to make it make sense it's you, you do what you can with what you got yeah, well, that's what I said. It was charity shops before. Uh, then um, uh, there still is a lot of a lot of kids today do that sort of thing, go get interested in shoes. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I liked uh, Army and Navy because you could get cheap T-shirts there. Then I could, if I messed them up, it didn't cost too much because they only cost that. I think they were under a pound uh, yeah. T-shirts in 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 the seventies. I, I remember I remember some of them were, but you would then get the ripped ones. You go down to Boy or something like that and spend an absolute ah, fortune. Yeah, that's, that's designer chic you're on about there. Yeah. I know, but a bit, bit, of, bit of Vivian Westwood, that's what you want. It's going to be sorted. It's uh, well worth it, those sort of interesting days. But talk about art, and it is that interesting combination. You get art and music, and a lot of those are running parallel in what you do. I mean, you design your own sleeves and so on and so forth. How important is that uh, in, in, in your life? Well, I came through art school before punk happened, and that was uh, because I was reading all the music papers, because I was influenced by David Bowie, Alice Cooper, Roxy Music, and I find out reading interviews in NME, Melody Maker and Sounds, I used to buy all three uh, on the Thursday in Birmingham, and uh, they, you found out they all went to art school. I said, well, that's where you got to go. you got to go to art school. So when I left school, I went straight to art school. And then uh, punk happened while I was at art school. So I was at the right age, in the right environment, in in making stuff. and when I that's when I discovered how I could make my own trousers was I spilt some acrylic paint on my on my jeans, and I washed the jeans and it didn't move. There you it go. Didn't wash off. So I thought, hang on, hang on, stencil, stencil, and then suddenly uh, I was making rude trousers. Brilliant. I mean, and that's what happens. It's that sort of creative performance things like Pete Townsend smashing his guitar on stage. It's all of that combination of art and music, isn't it? Yeah. Well. Uh, they, uh, so, uh, the other way of getting into a band was that that's where musicians often congregated in the art art school. So that you, I, I wasn't any good at playing guitar to start with. So uh, 
some people think I hadn't got much further. But uh, yeah, no, I. Uh, that's where. That's where uh, you you got into a band was that you might rub shoulders. And and in fact, uh, the swell maps. Two of the swell maps were in the same building in the same year. And following on the year behind me was uh, Duran Duran's John Taylor. So right. there you go. Bit no, of Midland, all, uh, all Midland uh, sounds. You know that uh, Pete Frame sounds where they used yeah. to have all the, the the family trees of the rock bands. Yeah. yeah. And, and they're all, everybody, it's, it's all six degrees of separation, isn't it? I mean, when we look at things, I mean, the other passion in your life is football. I and mean, you've had three goes at getting the uh, the song for the World Cup. Uh, and Aston Villa is your team. Talk to me about those. Well, it was, uh, it's a shortcut to pu quick publicity, having a football song out uh, to, uh, and, uh, obviously, uh, a big passionate footballer. I love playing, I love playing football. I can't play anymore now. The knees won't let me. And uh, the... Um, and I was quite good at it. That's the other. That was the other marvelous thing about it. it was because uh, uh, the other thing about football and being in a band uh, in the dressing room of both, you get you have to put, you know, you get a, have to have a thick skin. You know what I mean? Uh, so uh, playing football was great. And then uh, the England songs, uh, I think it was with three lines that set the set the uh, fireworks off. And we thought, hello, you get on the telly, you get you get loads of publicity, and it did work for a while. But then, of course, I was with Cherry Red, and Cherry Red specialised in football songs. And uh, they do the Celtic CD, they did the Liverpool CD, they'd top, they virtually did every club's CD, the fan songs and football uh, FA Cup songs. And they said, uh, Spears, you're a Villa fan. Uh, have you got any Villa songs? I said, yeah, of course. I hadn't got a Villa song. So uh, he said, yeah, what's he called? So off the top of my head, I said, it's called The Sun Never Sets on Aston Villa. And uh, so uh, six, six weeks later, I got a phone call, said, uh, have you got that track? Uh, I said, yeah, 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 yeah. When do you want it? He said, uh, next week. So uh, hurriedly, I got the band together and we wrote it in one evening and then we recorded it in the four hour booking at a 16 track studio and mixed it that night. And I delivered it. And it's like one of the best Miller songs ever, actually. Actually, it actually won a vote. When, when Randy Lerner took over the club at Aston Villa, he, uh, he, he had his uh, uh, marketing team and he went out finding out what, they, what the fans feel and think on websites. And uh, so they wanted to know what the song the fans want to hear when the team take to the field. And my song won by a narrow percent. There you go. That's what you want. Fantastic. They still didn't do it. They didn't use it. Oh, no. And they didn't use E is for England either. You know, and, and, and the other ones, On the Road to Yokohama. Come on. That was, that was quality, that was. Yeah. Uh, I, I, there's poetry in that, in that lyric. And we're <laughs> England. I love it. There's a pattern here, isn't there? You, when you write these sort of glorious things, which is wonderful. But of um, course, as, as soon as the team lose and they fall out, so do the sales. <laughs> Yeah, oh, but well, that's the problem, isn't it? But you can you can get that moment, and I think that that's the fun thing. And people love those sort of novelty records. And we just had on the uh, uh, I don't like that word novelty. I don't use the word novelty. No. You, don't, you don't use it. You don't use the <laughs> novel. Well, some some people dismiss others as novelty, don't they? We had well, Glenn Hoddle, who's just recently been unmasked on the Masked Singer. The he said, pointing to a telly over there. Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry. Sorry. What do you think of that? Would you ever be tempted to go on the Masked Singer? I could see its appeal, and no, is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm all about I'm all about expressing myself, and I'm stuck yeah. in a big spongy costume. That's nothing to me, you know. No, no, no I, I get that. I understand. Well, the other thing you do, as you say, you, you don't scream and grunt and do that sort of stuff. You do songs with meaning. And the wonderful thing about um, you foresaw a lot of these things about surveillance and so on and so forth with City of Eyes in 2014. Talk to me about that. Well, of course, I was uh, just reacting to what I was seeing, the, uh, the growth of CCTV and that this country particularly has got the greatest number of CCTV cameras pointing at us. And of course, uh, read about the, uh, the, the Chinese have developed software that can actually work out who you are by the way you walk. This is why I keep breaking my legs. So I've got a different walk. And then, uh, <laughs> and, and it's just all that, uh, all that uh, keep cash in the economy and that don't move everything to online banking because the Chinese, you see, they're the bad guys at the moment. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they will, they can modify your behaviour and where you go with your finances because your banking goes. You, you know, if you get a job and your money goes straight to the bank and you can't get your money out, keep cash in the economy, people. That's what I say.
Well, and, and that's the interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, people now are so worried about, uh, do you remember that big thing about identity cards? And they were totally irrelevant because there were so many cameras, so many bits of information that you give out to the world freely. Like every time you use a credit card, they know where you're Oyster card, you that sort of credit stuff. card, your yeah. passport. Yeah. It's all over, even a little facial recognition now that you get even on Facebook, which was another reason for the song as well. Because I know I'm, 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 I, they've got me, you know. I've given out everything on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. They, come and get me. You know where I live. You know what I look like. You know how I walk. You know. So, but I would suggest to anybody, don't do it. In fact, my son, I got him onto Facebook, uh, uh, showed him how to do it. And he, after a couple of years, said, no, I'm not having this. And like my song, you know, he's, he's, he's taken heed of my lyrics and he's wiped himself off Facebook. You can't trace him. He's not there. Well, you have to know what you're doing because you work on the basis that everything you put out there is going to get in the hands of the wrong people eventually. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and as you <laughs> said, it can be manipulated. I always say never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. And, and you should question everything because nowadays we're bombarded with information, 99.9% .9 of which is rubbish, isn't it? Well, that's what has happened in the, in the, in the, in the negative, even with, with, with this government and, and Trump, uh, how they've... Uh, They've made you distrust uh, decent journalists. They've made you distrust uh, uh, the news generally. And they've made you distrust politicians. And the politicians are electable. You can get rid of them, but not when they get further up the ladder and then they suddenly change. And that's what, that's what we've got to keep changing. Yeah, it, it is a sort of worrying times. I always say to, to our children, you have to get your news source, not just from one place, because otherwise all you're doing is confirming prejudices. So you've got to watch yeah. the BBC, ITV, Fox, CNN, then go over to RT for a different view, have a look at Al Jazeera, and just see how the stories of the world are being reported. Yeah, no, you've got to, uh, you've got to look underneath the carpet. No, you're absolutely right. And the, 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 other, the other thing you mentioned, I mean, George Orwell obviously plays a, a, a big part in, in, in your sort of thinking on, on a lot of things. Uh, talk to me about uh, the road to Wakefield Pier. Well, that was uh, just what happened that we, we, we videoed a sort of a behind the scenes uh, leading up to a gig. A friend of ours lived in the area and he said, I could do you a lovely little video DVD. And so it was Wakefield, not Wigan. And so we called it. That's the only reason the parallels with Orwell there. But obviously I've written, been influenced by uh, George Orwell. And, I, you know, the B side of Where's Captain Kirk uh, was uh, Amnesia, which is about... Uh, Winston Smith being in the torture chamber, room 101 and Big Brother is all in the words there. And of course, all that leads up to City of Eyes with this surveillance uh, authoritarian society. So uh, that's where I'm at, man. And my inter Instagram is at Spies All Well, see? Oh no, I, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I see what you do, that's exactly what happens. But talk about amnesia. Amnesia is not something you suffer from because you have a brilliant memory. And I remember last time you were saying that uh, the way you remember things is rather like a magician who will tell yeah. a story remembering a pack of cards. So I thought that what we should do, we should try a little experiment with this as well, is that the people who've been in your band, which are punk royalty, have gone through your band. Talk me through the different members of the band and when they were in uh, and during what stages. Go for it. Right, well, uh, the first guest uh, musician was uh, 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 Jimmy Percy when he decided to do a help us out on drums at the Vortex in 1977. We, we, didn't know where, we didn't know who the hell he was until afterwards. Uh, and then Pa Molly became the next guest uh, drummer. Uh, we did three shows with her, Susie the Bears, she's in 1978 on that screen tour I was telling you about. So yeah, I've, uh, and I, I, I've met the Slits, but uh, that's the only one I've worked with, uh, Palm Olive. She's gone back to live in the United States. And then uh, Athletic Spears 80, uh, we had um, Pete Petrol came in and out of that band and he was in the original Spears Oil. And he, the, 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 one of the guitarists, uh, Dave Scott, he came in from, uh, he, was, he worked with Time and Dog, who was a, uh, a mentor for Joe Strummer before the Clash. And they were a group called Time and Dog and uh, Bank of Dresden, I think was another name they went under. And he came into Athletic Spies 80, End of Spies Energy, and all through Athletic Spies 80. And then we uh, get up to uh, the wilderness years. There's not a lot of many guests there, but Ian Page helped me out on some recording from Secret Affair. And I was in the Hazel O'Connor film, which uh, Tony Visconti was the uh, executive music producer. And uh, that helped uh, with my recent releases, which is, of course, uh, mixed 
with uh, Christmas in Denmark Street and the new one, Valentine's Day, which we haven't got round to yet. I don't know why you're taking so long. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's just come out this this month, January. Yeah, Valentine's it Day. It is absolutely good. Many people, not many people covered this song because it's in the later period from uh, the next day. And it's also uh, went, got a bit under the radar because of its uh, serious uh, content about a, uh, a student who went and killed uh, his classmates in... Uh, on valentine's day so that's why it's a bit heavy but it's great it's a simple rock band tune and uh and tony visconti where's me bell i was gonna say you've got to have your name drop bell every time you've got tony yeah visconti. tony visconti he uh he played on the original and he mixed he produced the original on david bowie lp and uh and now he's mixing the space energy one well, well that's what i wanted to do i wanted to build up to this moment and well done by the way because that was every single member virtually virtually every single member in order but i there is that theme of david bowie which is why it's so important to put it into context running through your stuff and tony as you say he did uh, christmas in denmark street as well as um uh, valentine and what i love about it what i love about it is it's that's a bit of loyalty isn't it you, you go back a long way talk to me about your relationship with tony well it's about the the well, our first it got got to see him was when I was auditioning to play, be the drummer in the Breaking Glass movie, and then uh, I bumped into him over the years. And he, as he mentioned on the on the Liz Kershaw radio show, BBC Six, uh, he mentioned uh, seeing me in. Uh, but yeah, what was amazing, he got the street down Brewer Street. He was in Brewer Street. I last saw him in 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 a, in an open air environment. And then uh, you know, messaging on Facebook over the years, I finally uh, got it together. Hey Tony, oh, oh yeah, went to see him playing Holy Holy with the uh, Woody Wood Mansi Holy Holy with Glenn Greg Lee of Heaven 17. I should have dropped him down on that list of, because uh, I was I was a sort of a, a guest member of uh, Heaven 17 in the, uh, in the period of temptation when that was a hit because uh, Glenn had a, a dodgy knee, so he was a bit immobile and Martin Ware and Ian Craig Marsh, they were stuck behind synthesizers. So they hired me to just jump around and be a like a regular rock and roll style guitarist and uh, so that was that anyway so uh back to uh, back, back, back in the room where were we uh, oh, yeah. you, you were saying you wanted to promote the single a bit more so i was helping you out so you oh yeah about the oh, yeah. relationship with tony visconti and and how that came about that sort of history oh yeah we were years. yeah we went to see holy holy at the uh at the uh roundhouse and um my manager, my new manager, uh, joined me a year ago, and he uh, he was there as well. And uh, we were in the after show VIP bar. And uh, <laughs> that's where the double. Room. And I said, Tony, uh, we got an idea, and we got a song. Uh, and he said, Well, send me the demo of it, and uh, and I'll give it a listen. If I like it, we'll do something. And he liked it, and he did the mix for it. And you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. Uh, let's get a two for one. Uh, would you like to do this other song? And when we, it was a Bowie song and a song that he worked on, and it, it was a, it surprised him, he he went with it, yeah. But, uh, and fantastic stuff. And Kevin Armstrong, who's been in your list of people. Oh, well. yeah. I, I was trying to give you see what Kev. I had to do when you're doing your memory test as well. There was a lovely there was a lovely build. You know, it's like weaving a story. This is what happened. You're an artist. I wanted to weave the story. Talk about you as a little kid, and Susie the Banshees, and the building up with Tony. And then I was going to do the little connections with Bowie. You know, Bowie, and you're going to do all that sort of stuff. And I thought Kevin Armstrong. There you go. He worked with Bowie. Well, uh, before Kevin Armstrong, there was Lou Edmonds who left the dam to join us. In and, 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 and when we amazing. toured America, he decided to stay in America. So we came, we needed another guitarist when we came back for the Spizzles tour in 1981. And then that's when Kevin joined us live and he, uh, yeah, he worked, reworked our, some of our songs for the better. And uh, yeah, he turned up with David Bowie on Live Aid in 1985. I thought, I know him, he's, he was in my band. He said his voice got very high. And uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that was another quirky thing, yeah. No, I say it's all six degrees of separation, isn't it? Now, the other person who's been in for a very long time was Jeff Walker, 24 years. How, talk to me about Jeff. Yes, he's a long, he was the longest serving member of the band. Unfortunately, he, he, he wanted to pack it in uh, in his 24th year. So he missed out on the gold watch on the 25th year. But I, I promised to take him for a meal. But then this lot rubbish happened. So, uh, but yeah, no, Jeff, uh, Jeff's been through me with thick and thin. In fact, when, when, um, to, Two former bandmates in 19, uh, 20, 2012 uh, said they had too much work commitments. They couldn't be in Spears Energy anymore. And I, I said, well, it said get some get some people to stand in. And I said, OK. So I already knew there were some people been asking to be in my band. And that was Luca Comencini. And then I put a feeler out on Facebook and got in uh, Philip Ross who, on guitar. And he brought in a bass player, Ben Lawson. And then they, we had a rehearsal with Jeff. Jeff being my... Uh, 
my uh, sort of Geiger meter or whatever. And uh, after the, the boys had finished the rehearsal and packed up and gone, and uh, I said to Jeff, I said, well, what do you think, Jeff? He said, well, he said, they're a little bit raw, but I think they're good. I think they're good. I think, and they were, there was, and the, uh, the next gig was only a couple of days away from, so it was, it was send out the CDs, do the rehearsals, and one rehearsal, and then do the gig. And then Jeff went home and he fell over with his cymbal bag, the, the big cymbal bag on his back, landed on his two hands. He cracked one wrist and, and uh, sprained the other. The day, and he rang me up the next day. He said, it's busy, you're sitting down. I said, why? He said, uh, I think I can do the gig, but I'm not sure I can do it on painkillers. And so he did the gig on painkillers. He had these big straps on his wrists. And he, after one song, he took them off. He couldn't play with them, but he was on loads of painkillers. So, and he came up to this song, European Heroes, about a third of the way in through the set. And he said, what's the next song? I said, it's European Heroes. He said, I'm not doing that one. <laughs> so yeah, he's been a trooper. He, 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 he played with virtually broken wrists. I, I, it is amazing hearing the beat. The sort of, and actually when you've got that adrenaline going through you on stage, you don't feel the pain, do you? Oh, I think he did. <laughs> <laughs> I've nearly, I've, I've sometimes held a note too long and nearly blacked out, fainted. Oh, really? Okay. I, yeah, that's quite an experience. I fell off stage like, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, you know how um, Only Falls the Horses, he falls through that? Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. There was this gig at the Electroworks, it was, in, uh, in Angel, Islington, and it was, it was late at night as well. And there's a smoke machine, and in the sound check, I said, look out, chaps, there's a, there's a gap down there, right in between the steps of the stage. And uh, careful there. And guess what? Yeah, me, Muggins here, the smoke machine. I didn't see it. Plop, someone video. It's on YouTube. Oh, they've got it. Oh, they've got the video. Brilliant. Somewhere, so I can't remember which one. Yeah, Electro works. And uh, it's, I don't know whether he put it on Facebook only or he put it on YouTube. But yeah, my, le my leg just goes straight down. I went straight, straight. I was just saying, well done to the lads and fell straight off stage. Oh. And it did a terrible thing because it, it squeezed all the blood up in my, in my leg. Right. And I had this terrible lump in my leg for a day, and I had another gig, and I couldn't sit in the back of the. I had to sit at the front with the legs stretched out in the right. on the way to Leeds, I think it was. Yeah, terrible time. I know, it's awful, awful. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I mean, it is your version of Valentine's Day. I thought was absolutely sensational. It was a very brave thing to do because it was a. You were playing it for some time in in your gigs anyway, weren't you? What was the decision to suddenly say, "Let's record it"? Well, what happened is um. As I got to an age where it's hard to buy birthday presents for me. And um, uh, so the family said, well, what do you want for your birthday? I said, well, I tell you what, I don't go to the theatre very often. Let's all go to the theatre to see this David Bowie play, Lazarus. Getting rave reviews and I'm a Bowie fan, so I went along. And me, and because uh, it was January, my birthday, everyone got coughs and colds and they started pulling out. So I then started asking friends who could go. And one of them was Luca Comencini, my guitarist. And uh, we went and we, we the, the one song that stood out above all the others because oh we were at the back i bought cheap i bought cheap tickets um and uh <laughs> we um uh, we thought yeah this time we got this we had this uh, bowie con uh, a, a concert every every year they did this bowie gr group of fans uh, they, do, they book bands that do bowie cover versions and we thought we, we like to drop in a bowie version while we're doing uh doing our own stuff um and so we did we, we thought this is it this is the song valentine's day we took it up there we played it over three years now we're uh, on and off and uh when that's why we decided this was this is the one to take to tony no I, absolutely and this this is why i mean we've come full circle from your days of arden school where you had the bowie haircut and the bowie uh, the, the, the appropriate color to releasing it now not only that but there's a limited edition uh version 200 interesting number 225 copies of the seven inch talk to me about that well we did uh, you know uh, the, I've had the thing about uh, MP3s. You can't sign an MP3. And when we were doing gigs, we brought when we started making records, bringing them out again. We with the City of Eyes, Here Come the Machines. We brought a uh, limited edition of vinyl because not everyone has. A lot of people have got rid of their record players, but some people came to the gigs and bought the vinyl. Say, I haven't got a record player, but yeah. they just wanted something to take home that they could smell the vinyl. You yeah, know. And um, so uh, we did a limited run of uh, Christmas in Denmark Street, and judging the numbers. We just don't want to make it to, to uh, uh, overdo it. We don't want, I've got a couple of boxes of Christmas in Denmark Street here. I, I might be able to shift them next Christmas. But, <laughs> but with Valentine's Day, I've, we got requests coming in when everyone knew it was coming out. Are you doing vinyl? So we thought, well, let's do a limited run to, to, to 
to satisfy those people. But the little trick we're saying is, you know, get the download because there will be a, a limited supply. And if this takes off a little bit, we don't know. We this is um, you never know unknown quantity. Uh, but we know how many quantity. <laughs> we thought two hundred twenty-five. One twenty-five. Uh, and what I love as well, I suppose, is a translucent lover's purple. Great colour. Well, yeah, the city vice. Um, Have you got one? Clear, clear yeah, blood red. Vice, clear blood red vinyl. Um, Hickam the Machines was regular black vinyl, but the reissue of Where's Captain Kirk, which was number one in the independent record label chart in 1980, uh, this week, uh, that was that came out on green vinyl on in a magazine called uh, Electronic Sounds. Uh, the Electronic Sound, they brought out a magazine with a, a limited edition that's in clear Vulcan green blood vinyl. Vulcan and now, green. yes. And I just thought purple, purple is the colour for Valentine rather than red hearts. We've all, you know, it's too common, but purple sort of. Yeah, but purple it's, is right. You've got to do something a bit different. It's a bit deeper than just the red, isn't it? And predictable with a red. So purple is, I think that's absolutely brilliant. Now you did, we've done a beautiful journey from the Bowie Connection all the way through to your early years to now, which is fantastic. Uh, you did promise halfway through, maybe even at the beginning, that you might finish on uh, an acapella version of, I'll, let, I'll tell you, you can pick whichever song you like. If you want to do Captain Kirk, you get a bonus. You can do Valentine, whatever you fancy. Finish on, on, a, on a song. <laughs> Tomorrow's world was yesterday. I heard the people say, slow burning in my heart, the universe and we can part. Spirit climbs a rock, waiting for a message outside. You couldn't get further from paradise. You couldn't get further from paradise. Cities fall and cities rise. We are on the other side. Doesn't matter if we win. We won't be continuing. People come and people go. People just don't want to know. Leaders win and losers lose. It's up to you to choose. We want the world and we want to make it last. Don't want it like the past. It's up to you to say We want the world and we want to make it last Don't want it like the past Time is running out And that is from Want the World, unreleased It's a song I use at the sound check Brilliant. There you go. You have spoiled us rotten. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been an absolute delight. Valentine's Day was released on the 15th of January. It is available now for download. Do hurry up and get those 225 copies in that limited edition, glorious colour, seven inch. Uh, but for now, Spiz, thank you so much for being my guest. Ciao. Bye-bye. So there you go, the wonderful Spears. Thank you so much for joining us uh, again today and more episodes of The Andrew Eborn Show. Uh, don't forget, you can follow us on all of the usual channels at Andrew Eborn, at Octopus TV, at Stella TV 4 on Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe on all the usual channels. Um, but until next time, I've been Andrew Eborn. You've been great. Thank you very much for joining me.